to hymn number 266. Number 266. I got a quick one today. I didn't know how worn out y'all be from your school. <laughs> but I had this apple, and no, I'm not going to make y'all get good treats for today. Oh, you want an apple? <laughs> so I had this apple, and then who likes the skin on the apple? You do? Oh, you do? I peel it off. You like the skin, or you just like the apple inside? You do? You like the skin? You like an apple? You like apples? No? Yeah, it slices. So what happens when, you know, this apple looks pretty good, right? It, it's shiny. No, I don't see any bruises. And then what happens sometimes when you, well, there's one, when you cut into them, you hope it's going to be nice and fresh and juicy. And then what happens sometimes? It's rot and it's not. It may look good on the outside, but then you cut inside and you're disappointed. Boy, you really want that apple. You know what makes me disappointed is when I find a piece of chocolate when I've wanted a piece of chocolate and I open that wrapper, melt it. It's nasty. It done got old. I can't eat it. it makes me sad. Yeah. So. It says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far, far from me. So some, 
some are like this, some Christians, right? We're pretty, we're shiny on the outside. We show to people all the things we're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> but that love for God is only on the outside. It's only on the skin. It's not in the heart. Because although some people do all the right things, you open that up, but deep down they're still doing all the wrong things. So the lesson today is what? Love God all the way through to your heart, not just on the outside what people can see, but all of you, and all of you love God. Don't let it just be on the surface, because then you're easily led into temptation and into things that are not good for you. When people see you, let them realize that you really love God, and that's not just surface. It's not just for show. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you today that you do love us, Lord. We thank you that you're here with us every step of the way. Help us to love you, Lord, with all our hearts and to show kindness and love to each other, Lord, and not just walk out this church and act like a different person than as we are in church. Amen. No. Right, take your red hymnals again and turn to hymn number 80. Hymn number 80, and we'll sing both stanzas. Jesus, though. 
extra piece of paper out here that we need to read this to. Just let them know it's out there. It's out there. It's already out. Okay. Let them know it's out there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. In our announcements, um, don't forget about church board meeting tonight at 5 o'clock in the fellowship hall, and everyone is invited. Um, also, our church has set up a temporary fund for anyone who would like to make a donation to help with Allison's funeral expenses, and anything will be greatly appreciated. Youth Car Wash, Saturday, August the 27th from 8 to 11. Don't forget about our Sunday School Banner. And then on September 24th is the bridal shower for Victoria and Jacob. And then there are some upcoming youth events and there is a little flyer out in the vestibule um, that will give you some um, dates and some details on all of those upcoming events. So do we have any other announcements? We had any birthdays in the last week? Okay. All right. If you'll take your red hymnals again and turn to hymn number 12. <clears throat> number 12. And we'll sing all four stanzas.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh my goodness, we're going to have to do that again. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? Great. I like it when I hear great. We serve an amazing God, do we not? We serve a God who loves. We serve a God who watches over us, who protects us, who provides for us. But most importantly, we serve a God who made salvation available to us. Aren't you thankful for a God who saves, who protects, who provides? And every once in a while, even makes us feel good, huh, Mr. Nelson? It's good to see you this morning. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we need to remember the ones that are on our prayer list. Let's do especially be in prayer for Allison's family. Uh, the arrangements are um, the, uh, there will be a visitation this Wednesday here at the church from 11 to 12, and the service will be at 12 o'clock here at the church. So do be in prayer for, um, for the girls and for all of um, Allison's family. We will be providing food afterwards, okay? Also continue to pray for uh, Mike. I went by and saw him yesterday. He is uh, still in the ICU at uh, UMC, but he is some better in some ways, but he, he definitely needs that back surgery. Be, pray that the insurance company will release that and allow him to get that surgery because um, he just he cannot get comfortable in the bed at all with, uh, with his back. And, um, and that's the holdup right now. The insurance company says you've got to go through all these steps before they'll, they'll authorize that. But um, we know that God's able to... Uh, change hearts and change minds. So let's pray to that effect. Are there any other special requests that we need to remember this morning? All right, let's remember Brother Reggie. Daniel Smith and Carolyn Price. Chuck Smith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Our Father, how we thank you and praise you. How good you are to us. How you love us. How you care for us. You protect. You provide. Father, especially when we think about salvation and how your son was willing to come and live here on this earth and die on the cross in order that we can have a right relationship with you so that we can live in fellowship with you. Father, we're so thankful for that. We're thankful for this time we have to come together, the opportunity to join together our hearts, our voices in praise and adoration, recognizing you for who you are. But it's also a time that we can come with these burdens and requests. And Lord, we do lift Allison's family to you. We pray that you'd be with the girls right now. We ask, Lord, that you'd just draw them to yourself and encourage them and strengthen them. Be with Keith and Tommy, Lord. Continue to, to help them as well. And each of the family, Lord, we know that this is a very difficult time. But your promise is that your grace is sufficient. And we know that that's true. And Father, we just pray for your continued touch on each of them. Father, we pray for Mike. We ask that you would just give him a very special touch right now. We pray that you would um, move hearts in the, uh, at the insurance company, that they'll release him for the surgery and allow that to be done so that he can get some relief. Continue to strengthen and uh, encourage Gwen's heart, we pray, Lord, and each of the family as well. We pray that you just be with them. And the others that were mentioned, Lord, for Daniel and Carolyn and Chuck, and uh, Lord, each of the, the needs and burdens that... Uh, there's some that we just we can't express, we can't put into words, but you know each and every one, each heart and each 
need that there is. Father, first of all, may we surrender to you. May, may we allow you to have your way in our hearts, in our lives, in every circumstance and situation that we face. May we surrender to you and let you move and let you do what you know is best. I know there are times that we think we know what's best for us, but, uh, but we don't. You're the one that does. And so, Father, may we surrender to your authority. Again, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we have to gather here today. We pray that you will meet with us, that everything that we do, every song we sing, every word that's spoken, everything will be to honor and to glorify you. Meet with us, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, take your red hymnals and turn to hymn number 222. Number 222, and we'll sing all three stanzas. Ushers will come. We will receive your regular tithes and offerings. Ms. Rubino, would you lead us in prayer for the offering, please?
your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. And while you're turning there, I've got a couple of things I want to mention. Um, <clears throat> we received a, a notification from the Center for Pregnancy Choices, the results of our baby bottle fundraiser. I want to thank you for your generosity. Forest Grove provided $427.43. Uh, to the Center for Pregnancy Choices. And that's, that's really a very good offering for us. Thank you for that. Um, it will help them tremendously as they endeavor to help um, girls in our community that are faced with um, difficult choices sometimes. Uh, they, there's also a, a little note here that they included. I'll put this on the bulletin board. But if you make Amazon purchases, if you'll go through smile.amazon.com, uh, you can select the Center for Pregnancy Choices of Lawrence County, uh, Mississippi, and um, they will make donations. A certain percentage of your, uh, of your purchase will go to the, uh, the local CPC. And um, that's also a good way to give in an ongoing basis, especially if you make purchases through Amazon. There was a Peanuts cartoon where Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything, I hate everybody, I hate the whole world. <laughs> Charlie looked at it and said, but I thought you had inner peace. Lucy replies, I do have inner peace but I still have outer ab obnoxiousness. I know some church folks like that. Thankfully, none of them here. But um, Isaiah 26, you're probably wondering what that has to do with what we're going to talk about. You'll see in a moment. We're going to talk about peace, perfect peace. The God who keeps is the title of the message. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is, the la is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the foot of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is, upright, is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. We live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a time where it seems that we can't depend on anyone or anything. Peace evades us. I, I read some interesting statistics. I'm not going to go over these statistics. But from the beginning of history, I think it said that there were somewhere around 261 years total of peace on this earth. See, now that's 261 years out of at least 6,000 years. Peace seems to evade us. We're looking for peace. We want peace. The world seems to be controlled by turmoil and unrest. Times like these, we need someone on whom we can depend. We need someone to whom we can turn that will be there, someone that we can trust, someone that we can with confidence call on and know that they're there, that they're listening, and that they will hear when we call. We need someone that can protect us and see us through the difficult times. We have just that person, and his name is the Lord God Almighty. 
He is the one to whom we must turn. When we need a God who can keep, he can. Yet so often we turn to our own resources. I mean, after all, we're pretty smart, right? We, we can do a lot of things. I mean, look at what man has been able to accomplish, right? I, I was reading this week that uh, they had a, um, a helicopter and a rover on Mars checking, looking for life that had been there before, and they found some debris of a wrecked spaceship or something like that that was made in, anybody want to guess? Not the year, but the location. <laughs> no, actually it was made in the USA. You know, it's interesting. We, we go and we go places, we look for things, and what we find out is that no matter how good we are and no matter how much we've been able to accomplish, there are times that we still need help. There was a weightlifter. I read this this morning. Um, I can't remember what year it was. It was in the Olympics. And he was having some problems, and in the two, uh, two of the uh, uh, things that he normally excelled in, he didn't even place because of the, the health problem he was having. I think he was sick or something. And he had one last uh, event, and I can't remember what the event was, but it says that it said that when he got to that event, he knew that he needed help, and so he prayed and asked the Lord to help him, and he set the world record, and he lifted over 415 pounds above his head. Can you imagine what that took? But he didn't depend on his own strength. He depended on God. And it's a reminder to us that there are times that when we, when we try and do things our own way, well, let's look to history. When we look to history, what do we see the children of Israel doing? God told them to trust him. God told them that in all things to walk with him, believe him, obey him, do what he said, live according to his purpose and plan, and God would watch over them, he would protect them, he would provide for them, he would do all of these things. And what did the children of Israel do? They depended on themselves. They depended on their own abilities, their own resources, rather than the God who keeps. You know, when I look around, you know what I see? I see the children of Israel. Because we do the exact same thing. We depend on ourselves. We depend on our own resources. We depend on our own gods. Now, we may not call them gods. We have other names for them, but that's what they are because you see a god is anything on, on to whom we turn or on whom we depend rather than God himself. And so if we're really going to put our trust and faith in God, then we're going to turn to him, depend on him, rely on him in all situations, all circumstances, and for all things. When we look to the gods of the land rather than the God of the universe, what's going to happen? We're going to have problems. We're going to fail. Matthew Henry wrote this, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, in perfect peace, inward peace, outward peace, peace with God, peace of conscience, peace at all times, in all events. Trust in the Lord for that peace, that portion which will be forever. God can keep us in perfect, complete peace. If. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things about the, God, the uh, promises in the Bible. I, I know it sounds odd, but it is beautiful. Those, those if statements. God said, if we do this, then he will do this. That, you know, the ifs for us, really, when you stop and think about it, it's really pretty easy. And we make it hard. If we trust God, if we depend on God, if we allow God to lead us, if we allow God to guide us, now that's really not that hard, is it? And yet we make it so difficult. But God can keep us in perfect peace, complete peace, if we will only trust in him. And that is, after all, what Isaiah is trying to tell us. So let's look at this verse in a little bit more detail. Thou wilt keep him 
there's two important statements here. We're talking about who's doing the keeping and who's being kept. And it's important for us to understand exactly what Isaiah is talking about. The who is doing the keeping is clear. That's God himself. In Genesis 28, 15, we're told, And behold, I am with thee. This is a promise that God was making to Abraham. I am with thee and will keep thee in all, pla in all places whither thou goest. Now, let me stop there for just a second. Excuse me. How, how well did Abraham follow those instructions? If he depends on God and trusts in God, God will keep him. We know of at least two times that Abraham didn't depend on God, right? When they went to Egypt, and then I, I can't think of the other place that he went to, but both places where he told them that Sarah was his sister, which was not a lie. She was his half-sister. But Rather than depending on God, he depended on his own resources and almost got in trouble both times. Hmm. But the promise that God said, gave to him, I'm with you, I will keep you in all places that where you go, I'll bring you again to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done that which I've spoken to thee of. God's promises to Abraham, God's promises... <laughs> in Isaiah to the children of Israel are the same promises that God makes to his people today. First of all, to guard and protect. We need to consider the importance and meaning of to keep because that's what that word is talking about. This word is used, it's translated keep 23 times in the Old Testament, most of them in the Psalms, and there the word adds the idea of obeying from a man's point of view. In other words, when we do what God says, God will keep us. Makes sense, right? Uh, God will, gu will guide us. He will show us the way to go. And when we walk in that way, he'll protect us. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, of soldiers as they're going through and they clear a path in a minefield. And they tell the people behind them, step where I step. And as long as they step in those footsteps, right where they step, they'll be able to safely walk through. But what happens if they don't? could have disastrous consequences, right? The same is true for us spiritually. God says, walk in this way, and I will protect you. I will keep you. I will watch over you. God is the keeper. He's the one doing the keeping, none other than God Almighty. This is the God of the universe, the God who created all things, the God who spoke and the worlds came into existence. He's got a little bit of power, doesn't he? The God who knows all things. Can anybody tell me what's going to happen tomorrow? Nobody? Now, I know you're thinking, well, I'm going to school. I'm going to work. We, we have all these things. But do you really know that that's what's going to happen tomorrow? No, that's what you have planned to do. But you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. God does. Not only does God know what's going to happen tomorrow... He knows what's going to happen Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day for the rest of your life, for the rest of eternity. God knows all of these things. Why is it so hard for us to trust him? Why is it so hard for us to depend on him? If he knows these things and he is able to keep us, Peter said, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Jude talks about God keeping as well in Jude one twenty four. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. They both realize the importance of depending on God. And God has the power and ability to keep us. Will we let him? Will we surrender to him? Will we walk in his way? Him, the one who trusts. This is the one who places his confidence in God to keep in times of trouble. What does it mean for us to trust God? It means that we place ourselves totally and completely at God's disposal. 
It means that I surrender myself to God's control. It means that I am all God's in all things. Uncle Oscar was a little apprehensive about his first airplane ride. He had heard a lot about airplanes and you know, he'd heard all those bad things too and he was just a little bit upset, a little bit nervous. But he finally went, he got on the plane and he flew and when he got back, his friends were eager to know how everything went and if he enjoyed the flight. Well, commented Uncle Oscar, it wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. But I'll tell you this, I never did put all my weight down. Sounds silly, doesn't it? How many times do we do that with God? Oh, God, I trust you, but, but, I, but I, I can't put all my confidence and all my trust in you because, I mean, after all, I, I'm not sure, you know. I, I got to hold some back. I see some of you have a lot of trust in these pews. Y'all are sitting back quite relaxed, not worrying about a thing. Good reason. Why can't we do that with God? Why can't we trust God like that? We can. It just requires surrender on our part, letting God, believing that God will keep, that God will preserve, believing that this God who says, this is what I'll do, will do just that. We can trust him. We can. We just have to. It's, all we have to do is say yes. Yes, God, I trust you. I believe you. I know that you know what's best. I know that you know what's right. And I'll let you work things out. Even though I don't understand, I, I, I don't know why things are happening like they are. I don't know why things go the way they go. I don't know why this is happening, but I know that God has a purpose in all things. And I know that God works all things together for the good of him who loves him and are called according to his purpose. God is in control, and he's working. We can trust him. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Now, if you read that in the Hebrew, it's not going to say perfect peace. It's going to say peace, peace. The word peace is repeated for emphasis. You ever done that? You ever repeated something to emphasize it? Sure we have. We do that quite often. And the Hebrew uses that. In, in the Hebrew language, it'll, it'll uh, duplicate a word. And the Greek does the same thing at times in order to place emphasis on it. Peace, peace, that's the result. It, it's with emphasis. It's complete. Albert Barnes said, The mind that has confidence in God shall not be agitated by the trials to which it shall be subject by persecution. It's far more than a feeling of calm assurance. You know, when we, when we think about peace, we talk about peace. What picture comes to your mind? How many of you think of a of a calm, serene lake, smooth as glass, almost like a mirror that you can see the mountains reflected in the, in the water behind it. I know I've told you this before, but I was reading this the other day and it reminded me of, of just this. There was a man who wanted a painting that displayed peace. And so he, he, uh, he started a, a um, competition and all these artists painted their paintings and they brought them and they covered them up. And one by one, he went through uncovering them. And they had 12 of them there. And the first 11 they uncovered, that's what it was. It, there, there were rivers and there was all of these things, just beautiful, serene images. Then he took the cover off the last painting. And you could hear the gasps in the audience because the painting was of a stormy day and a waterfall, water cascading down. You could almost hear the water as it, as it crashed onto the rocks below. Couldn't hear yourself think. And the, the, uh, the sky was cloudy. It looked like it was about to, to storm at any second. And, and as they're looking at that, they're trying to figure out, how does this display peace? And then beside the waterfall, coming out from the side of the cliff, well, it was a little scrub tree. It wasn't sticking out very far. Almost as though it was reaching out to the water to, to tempt it, to test it. And there was a little fork in the tree. And in that fork 
It was a bird's nest. And on that bird's nest sat the mother bird sitting on her eggs. Calmly, serenely, peacefully. You see, that is the image of peace. In the midst of all the turmoil and all that's going on around us and everything that's just going haywire, if you will, we can still have peace in our hearts when we trust in God. And just like that mother bird sitting on her nest, we can rely on God and know, God's got this. He's in control. And I'm going to trust him to see me through. It's a gift, the gift of God. The Lord gives strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That's what the psalmist tells us. We can't find it anywhere else. We can't purchase it. You can't go to the store and buy it. It can't be won in battle. This is a peace that comes only from God. And it's a gift that he gives us. It's abundant. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Not only is it a gift, but there's no limit to it. Just as God is limitless, so is the gift of his peace. It's peace like a river, Isaiah tells us in 48, 18. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Interesting when you think about that. You go down to the river and watch sometime. What do you see as the water's going by? No matter how long you sit there, water's still going, still flowing, still there. Peace, like a river. It doesn't stop. God provides that peace. It's never ending. Or go down to the seashore and watch the waves coming in. Wave after wave after wave. We can trust God for that limitless supply of peace. Perfect, complete, finished peace because it's from God and therefore it is perfect. The fact that this peace is emphasized means that it is complete. It's perfect. It's evident from the fact that God is the source of peace. In 1555, Nicholas Ridley was burned at the stake because of his witness for Christ. On the night before his execution, his brother offered to remain with him in the prison chamber to be of assistance and comfort. Nicholas declined the offer and replied to his brother that he meant to go to bed and sleep as quietly as ever he did in this life because he knew God was in control. He knew the peace of God and he could rest in the strength of his everlasting arms and so can we. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The mind, this thing that we think with. Now, you know, when we think about mind, that's what we limit it to is just what we think with, but it's really more than that. The word that's used in the Hebrew carries more of a meaning. It had the idea of conception. In other words, it's not just your thoughts, but it's all of you. Where do those thoughts come from? What, what initiates those thoughts? You know, we, we think about things based on external circumstances sometimes, external inputs. There are different things that we experience that cause us to think different things. But all of these thoughts, this, our mind, and what we think about, when we set our entire being on service and surrender to God, when we focus on God, when we allow God to have his way, and we just simply trust God and depend on God, then our minds can be stayed on him, focused on him. This word stayed, reflex, to lean upon or to take hold of in favorable or unfavorable sense, to bear up, to establish. Can we hold on to God? Can we trust him? Amy Carmichael was a missionary to India. 
And she wrote this. She said, Blessed are the single-hearted, for they shall enjoy much peace. If you refuse to be hurried and pressed, if you stay your soul on God, nothing can keep you from that clearness of spirit, which is life and peace. In that stillness, you know what his will is. Knowing the will of God is simply trusting God. It's simply depending on God, simply allowing God to guide us. What does God want me to do? Where does God want me to go? What's the next step? I'll just trust him. I'll let him guide me, and I'll depend on him. And as we depend on God, then we find that God is in control. But you know what? We live in an impatient society. Did you know that there's even a pot roast that you can cook in a microwave in less than 10 minutes? I don't want one. But you can. I like those kind that you put in the uh, crock pot and you cook for about six to eight hours. Let it simmer. Take some time. That's what makes it really good, right? But so many times we want to go to McDonald's and, whew, I placed my order 45 seconds ago. Where's it at? Why isn't my Big Mac ready? How many times we get so impatient in this life because we want what we want. We want it right now. How many times do we do that? How many times do we do that with God? Okay, Lord, I prayed. I, I, I prayed and I told you what I needed. I told you what I wanted. You know what God said? And? And? So? You see, the problem with that is this. It's one, one word, really one letter, I. Too many times in our prayers, in our devotions, in our dependence, it, it's I. I know what I want, and this is what I want God to do. And God's sitting back and just waiting and saying, okay. When you come to me and say, okay, Lord, what do you want? Then he will say, well, let's go. But when we come with, I want, then God's going to sit back and wait. Do we want peace? Do we want perfect peace? Do we want that peace knowing God? Then we depend on God. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is focused or stayed on him because he trusteth in thee. Trust. We've already talked about that, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. 2 Samuel said, uh, 22, 31, As for God, his way is perfect. The way of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. The psalmist says, They that trust the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Jeremiah said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Nahum said, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Trust is pretty important, isn't it? Trust. Simply trust God. Do we really trust him? When we talk about placing our trust in God, this is not a mental exercise, but a lifetime practice. It's when we say yes to God, we believe him, we trust him, we, we accept what God allows to come our ways, knowing that, okay, it's what's best. I don't understand it, but I know that God has a purpose in it. And so I'm going to say, yes, Lord, you know what's best. I trust him. If we're placing our trust in God, then he must be in control of our lives. And that includes our decisions as well as our actions. Verse 4 goes on to say, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord Jehovah, or in the Lord Jehovah, is everlasting strength. When we keep our trust on God, in God, he will keep us with his everlasting strength. A.W. Tozier wrote, What we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. 
For each of us, the time is coming when we shall have nothing but God. Health and wealth and friends and hiding places will be swept away, and we shall have only God. To the man of pseudo-faith, that is a terrifying thought. But to real faith, it is one of the most comforting thoughts the heart can entertain. I'm reminded of some of the stories that I've read and events that took place in Kentucky over the last couple of weeks. The, uh, I was reading some of the cover page from the Breathitt County paper. A wall of water 50 feet high swept through record flooding. Never have, the, have, have they recorded flood levels as high as they had a uh, week before last, I guess it was. Huh? I read some of the stories of there was one, one family that I think it was three children, four children, do you know? I think it was three children, uh, mom and dad and three children. And um, they ended up in a tree. They couldn't hold on to their children. All their children were swept away. But they survived mirac miraculously. They held on to the tree, they trusted that tree, and it held them. Unfortunately, they weren't able to hold on to, the, to their children because of the strength of the waters. Difficult circumstances, difficult situations, so many others that their homes were literally washed away. Um, one story I read of somebody was looking for their father who was asleep in a mobile home. The last time they saw it, it was going, it was going down the river. It had been washed away. Do we trust God? No matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, do we really, truly trust Him? When we place our trust in God, it can't be just words that we speak. It has to be an exercise, a practice. In fact, it has to become a habit, something that we do day in and day out. We trust God. Remember, God alone is the God who keeps. Trust in Him. He can and He will keep you as you trust in Him. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and he will guide you and guard your steps. Let's stand and bow. Let's pray together. Dalton, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?